was drafted. Mr. Chair, Mr. Um, Chair. I call David Clendon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Chair, the report back from the Select Committee, that is the majority report from the government members predominantly, make interesting reading. I've never read the Select Committee report, a majority report, where the government members of a committee have been so willing, indeed eager, to overturn some of the original provisions of the bill as it was first drafted. And to their considerable credit, they have recognised that many of the provisions in that original bill were utterly untenable. They were unacceptable to New Zealand, as the, the severity of what was proposed in that original drafting was a disgrace. And it's, as I say, a credit to the government members on the Select Committee that they, along with the, uh, the opposition members, saw that those provisions were untenable. They were unacceptable to New Zealanders, indeed. Sir, it's a, we know that, <coughs> well, unfortunately, what continues in this bill, which the Greens obviously are opposing, is an unacceptably low threshold, income thresholds for, for eligibility to assistance. The proposition that somebody earning the minimum wage should not be eligible for legal assistance reflects a complete lack of awareness, a disconnect between what uh, the lifestyle, shall we say, the, the lived experience of people making such propositions and those who are actually caught up in the legal process. We know that the minimum wage is significantly less than a living wage in New Zealand. It is not sufficient for somebody to have a decent standard of life, a decent quality of living. It suggests, however, in this bill that that is sufficient for people to afford an appropriate and decent defence if they find themselves in a, in a situation where they need legal representation. We heard from the Minister earlier a proposition that this bill will somehow deter those who might um, be in possession of significant wealth, who might be using family trusts or some other mechanisms to disguise that wealth and therefore, thereby become eligible. I'd be delighted if the Minister could point us to provisions in this bill that will remedy that situation. A person, I think she referred to a, a failed finance company director, still sitting on considerable personal wealth but managing to have concealed that wealth. I'd be delighted to have shown to me where in this bill that situation would be remedied, where that person would be obliged to pay for their own defence rather than appeal to legal aid. <coughs> So I think the low point of the original drafting was the proposition that in order to be eligible for, um, for legal aid, a person's um, so-called capital goods would be valued, people's clothing, their household goods. And for me, my, um, the personal bet noir, the notion that tools of trade should have to come into that calculation. The proposition that a person should be obliged to sell their tools of trade, the means by which they earn their living in order to become eligible for, for legal aid, is simply a nonsense. It's abhorrent. And it's to the credit of the committee that it has at least been thrown out of this legislation. So it's the points made in, our, um, in the Green Labor Minority Report that the in pursuit of cost savings of this legal aid scheme, the scant regard for the catastrophic effect on low-income New Zealanders and the ability to access the justice system, and the extent to which these propositions can potentially be seen to contravene the Bill of Rights Act has already been, been observed and noted. <coughs> Sir, it's not only low-income people who need to have concerns about this legislation. Middle New Zealand, people who are earning what might be deemed a living income, but who, for whatever reasons, um, are not well-to-do people, there's a significant number of middle-income New Zealanders who would struggle to afford decent representation in a court of law. And this bill legislation does nothing to recognise their situation, does nothing to, to alleviate or in any way deal with, their, uh, with that situation they could find themselves in. The, um, the proposition that a person can be denied legal assistance if they have not yet repaid obligations or debts from some former um, use of legal aid in itself seems not unreasonable, except that it overlooks a whole bunch of situations an individual might find themselves in where they're simply not able to afford to repay that, um, that obligation at the point at which it's, it's made. I think it's interesting that some of the conditions that appear in the SOP 134, 
For me, the proposition that a deduction from a person's income, from their salary, wages, whatever it might be, can occur, Mr Chair. David Clendon. Thank you, Mr Chair. The proposition is that a, a person becomes um, liable, rather that they're no longer entitled to legal aid, at the point at which a reminder notice is sent to that person. In 41B1, as opposed, proposed in this, um, this SOP 134, the section in terms of the deduction of overdue amounts applies whenever the Commissioner has reminded an aided person in writing of the person's obligation to pay an overdue amount. So one thing we know about low-income people, they tend to be very transient. They tend not to be in one place for very long. It's entirely um, reasonable to assume that people may not be aware of their obligation. Somebody who does not see a reminder notice nevertheless may suddenly discover that their income is having significant deductions taken from it. We are told further on in the SOP uh, 41H, so-called protected earnings, that 60 per cent of a person's um, net income may be protected. Turn that around. A person could lose 40, 40 per cent of their net income could be deducted in order to repay the so-called debt um, from some prior use of legal assistance. For a person on a low income or even a moderate income, that could be disastrous in terms of preventing them or taking away from them the ability to pay basic living costs, their rent, their power bill, their grocery bill. Forty per cent of income from a low income or even a moderate income person could just lead to complete financial collapse of a household. And whose interests are then served if that person is no longer able to, to um, provide the basic necessities for themselves, for the household they may well be supporting? That is an extraordinarily high um, provision, a very high bar enabling the Commissioner to take 40 per cent of a person's net income. So I won't dwell on it here, but we've had some significant submissions to this bill, of course, in the, in the process of the um, Select Committee hearings. The Criminal Bar Association pointed to the fact, in their view, that the bill as drafted systematically deconstructs safety nets available to those vulnerable people charged with criminal offences. They go on to say that they refer to the bill's improper balance between access to justice and the cost of a legal aid system, which will be at the cost of justice in a large number of cases. These are not trivial objections from a, from a group of people who are right at the sharp edge, who on a day-to-day -day basis their members see the reality, as uh, Ms Dalziel described, of places like the Manukau Court, the areas, the West Auckland Courts and so on, where it is not a matter of um, wealthy people concealing their wealth, it is a situation of people completely adrift in a system of which they have very little understanding, who need representation and will not be able to afford it. We know that self-litigants, and again this came through in a number of the submissions, that the, the denial of legal aid will lead to more self-litigation, so the penny saved will, re will result in a pound or more cost further down the track. Self-litigation slows the process of courts. Judges become um, by default, uh, purveyors of legal advice, court staff will be obliged or asked consistently, routinely, to provide legal advice, which is actually not what they are there to do. Self-litigation is recommended against, at various points, on the Justice Department's own website. The, the, the failures, the difficulties, the, um, the dangers to the accused person, the costs to the courts, the cost in terms of time to the judge and the whole judicial process are clearly out of step and not been taken account of in this. Inevitably, we will see more people trying to represent themselves who don't have the skills, the information, the wherewithal to do so. So any money saved by this quite draconian denial of access to legal aid will very quickly be hoovered up um, by other costs that are imposed further down the track. And unfortunately, that's a phenomenon we've seen all too much of recently. In their absolute determination to get this elusive budget surplus, the government is looking for line by line cost reductions without looking at the bigger picture. And when it's the big picture is the justice sector, that is untenable. It's not just a matter of um, financial impropriety. This is talking about absolute basic rights, basic access to the justice system. We ought not to be denying our citizens that. Thank you, Mr. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chair. Um, call uh, Andrew Little. Thank you, uh, <coughs> Mr. Chairman, for a call on this bill. 
Uh, Mr. Chairman,